my lords, we were midway through my points on the Uber judgment. Yes. Um, and we were on the second proposition, which I say can be derived from the Uber judgment, which is that the requirement for uh, mutuality of obligations it is not a requirement for mutuality in the sense of just bilateral obligations, but is a requirement, I say, for an irreducible meaning, uh, irreducible minimum of, of obligations. And I've shown you paragraph 126 of the Uber judgment, applying the Nethermere case from 1984 uh, and Carmichael, which I say uh, makes that point good. My third point on Uber is that not only is an irreducible minimum of obligation required under an individual assignment contract, but it's also required for there to be an umbrella or global or overarching contract. Of course, Uber dealt with individual assignment contracts, but it can't be right that Regulation 2.1 can mean different things in different contexts. I say it's clear from paragraph 41 of the Uber judgment where they set out the elements that must apply for there to be a worker contract, that an irreducible minimum of obligation is also required for an umbrella contract to be a worker's contract. The statutory definition doesn't draw any distinction between global umbrella or individual assignment contracts, and the same test for a contract, a worker's contract, applies in each and every case whether the employment tribunal is considering the global or the <coughs> single contract. Uh, and I say it simply can't have a different meaning depending upon what type of contract is at issue. My fourth and final proposition that I uh, draw from Uber is that the position under the umbrella contract is relevant to the position under the individual assignment contract, but is not determinative. Uh, and that is, I say, made clear from paragraph 91 of the Uber judgment, uh, which you have in the authority bundle at page 289. And your uh, submission is that although it's not entirely clear, uh, the employment tribunal judge found that the claimant was a worker in respect of both uh, the umbrella and the individual contract. Uh, indeed, my lord. Um, so it's that paragraph um, 242, which is at page 169 of the core bundle. Yes. Do we have an order? Uh, we just have his, so uh, you, his. You don't typically in an employment no, tribunal you have cases. The page one you two have four. indeed, my lord. That's the judgment that sets out his conclusions. Yes. So just conclude, says was a worker. Yes. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> so we said that two hundred and forty-two appears to conclude, although we can't be certain, um, that both contracts despite the absence of irreducible minimum obligation under both of them were worker contracts. That, that's what we understand to, to, to say. And is, there, is, it, is that clear from the way in which the case, or it hasn't, it's sort of, I suppose, been sort of well, stuck because of the appeals? Well, my Lord, the, the, appeal, appeal, appeal the Employment Appeal Tribunal and yourselves are, of course, concerned with the pure question of law, which is really whether the judge was right to say that an irreducible minimum obligation wasn't in Yeah, and you, you say because, because of these appeals no other progress has been uh, under, uh, has happened in respect of the underlying claim. Indeed, indeed my lord, because of course we need to get to the bottom of the status <laughs> issue first. We do have a hearing in the diary that would hopefully, um, if, if, if my lord's were, lady were to find against me, determine this issue. Um, it looks like paragraph 218 and 219 does appear to be saying uh, that both the overarching contract and the individual contracts were worker contracts. That's the implication. 
Um, my lord, um, what, what, sorry, all he's saying there, uh, my lord, is that there's an overarching contract and an individual contract. Um, and then, so he's just saying, I've already found there are contracts and I've already found that personal services required. But then he very clearly goes on to consider the relevance of the lack of an irreducible minimum of obligation. The way I read it is that 218 sets out the three requirements, 219 deals with one and two, and then under the heading which relates to the third thing, he then goes on and deals with number three, whether the exception comes out. That's how it seems to run as a matter of... Well, my lord, it, it can't, that can't be that can't right. Be right because the, reason, because the reason that can't be right is because he's found, and there is no appeal against this, He's found that there isn't um, uh, there isn't any irreducible minimum of obligation. Yes, I understand that. But in terms of how the thing is constructed, whether he's right or wrong, in terms of what he's doing, that's what he's doing by the looks of it. Well, my lord, I think what he's saying at two one nine is I found those contracts, and I found that personal service is required. Well, he's saying at two one nine. I've had a look at this, and neither contract is a contract of employment. So he's by implication, he's then going to go on and decide whether or not the tests he sets out at 218 are met so as to make the contract, either contract, uh, a worker contract. Is that what he's doing? Indeed, my lady, but he's also saying, I think, a bit more than that, because he's saying, I found already their contracts, so I'm not going to repeat all those findings yeah. here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But he's not saying, uh, as I understood my, my Lord to be suggesting, He's not saying anything in 219 about an irreducible minimum of obligation. No, no, he's not doing that, but I think he's saying in 219, I've dealt with 2181, I've dealt with 2182 because I already found that they agreed to provide his services personally. And then there's a third thing that has to be addressed, was um, the NMC a client? And if you look at the heading just below 219, it yeah. is, was the NMC a client? And I assume that the text beneath the heading is related to that. Indeed, my lord, and the difficulty there is, of course, he's not applying the test properly because at 218, he's not setting out the three conditions that need to be satisfied because he's forgotten everything that's been said in Byrne Brothers in 2001 and um, thereon onwards about the need for an irreducible minimum of obligation. So he sets himself the wrong test, as it were. But there's nothing in the... But no, he doesn't, because he, the, the test he sets out there is derived from the language of Regulation 2.1. My, my lady, it's not, and I, I, I'm conscious of the time, so I don't want to keep repeating myself, but all he's asking for there um, is, as I understand it, is what he is asking himself there is about personal service and about whether there's a contract, and he's forgetting the additional requirement of an irreducible minimum of obligation. But, but that, isn't, that isn't in the language of the regulation. Well, well madam, that, that is essentially the, the question for this court, yeah. um, but of course the Supreme Court says it is. <laughs> So, that, but that is essentially the case of this court, and it, I should stress, it's not just the Supreme Court last year that said this, the Employment Appeal Tribunal, the President of the Employment Tri Appeal Tribunal, as he then was, has been saying this since 2001, this isn't some sort of radical argument, and indeed this Employment Tribunal judge <coughs> was shown by me, Windle, and he was shown a series of Employment Appeal Tribunal judgments that make it clear that an irreducible minimum of obligation is required. Fortunately, Lady Justice Elizabeth Lane, in what I must call an illuminating judgment, whether I'm obliged to or not, deals with all of this. Uh, I'm conscious of that, my lord, and I'm going to address you on why that doesn't. Um, I'm going to address you on that, that point before I conclude my submissions. So the, the fourth point that I wanted to make on Uber is just about paragraph 91. Um, and the simple point... Uh, really, which is that even if you're not an, uh, under an obligation during periods when you're not working, so this is the umbrella contract point, that's not determinative of the position under individual assignment contracts. Um, my learned friend relies on this passage at paragraph 91 and says that what is being said at paragraph 91 is that Lord Leggett is saying that an irreducible minimum of obligation is never a prerequisite for a worker contract. Um, <clears throat> but with respect, that's incorrect. Lord Leggett is making a more nuanced point. He's simply saying that it's not determinative of the position, and he is accepting what was said in Windle, which is that it is relevant. Um, because where an individual only works intermittently or on a casual basis for another person, 
that can indicate a degree of independence or lack of subordination in the relationship while at work which is incompatible with worker status. So that's what's said in Windle's cited in paragraph 91. So I say that, that paragraph 91, contrary to what's suggested by my learned friend, that does not assist him. So I say, uh, my lords and my, my ladyship, that those are the four key propositions that can be derived from Uber. And I say that if you apply those four propositions to the facts of this case, particularly if we apply the, the helpful test contained in the Gunny case that I showed you just before the short adjournment, um, then we know that there is no obligation under either contract for the claimant to provide some work. But I've shown you several times that the written terms expressly exclude such an obligation and the Employment Tribunal finds that that reflects the true agreement he says the most that can be said is that the NMC encourages members to offer sitting days and does so more actively at times than others. My learned friend says, ah yes, but when Mr. Somerville agrees or when he shows up, then that is him switching on the app like they did in Uber case. But of course, there he misstates the facts of Uber. The key facts of Uber were not just that they switched on the app, but when they did so, they were under an obligation to accept a minimum amount of work, a certain number of, a certain percentage of trips. The claimant is never under such an obligation, as found by the Employment Tribunal, and no appeal against the finding that there is no obligation to provide a minimum amount of work. It can't be right that all is required is for a worker to simply attend work because that would subvert the requirement of the statute for a contract under which an individual has undertaken. So there must be an agreement to perform work rather than just the performance of work. So it's not whether he turns up to do work, it's whether if he does turn up to do work, he does so under a contract under which he's undertaken to do or perform any work. So I say that Uber puts the matter beyond any doubt that an irreducible minimum of obligation is a prerequisite for a LIMBY contract to exist. And that applies whether the LIMBY contract is an umbrella contract or an individual assignment contract. And given that you have findings of fact that are not disputed, that there's no irreducible minimum of obligation under either contract, this court can't find, or the Employment Tribunal erred in law in finding that the claimant could nevertheless be a worker. In my submission, the court is bound by the Supreme Court's judgment and doesn't need to consider any other cases. But my secondary submission, um, which I'll deal with briefly, is to show you the other judgments of this court, which I say uh, oblige you to, to make, reach that finding. There is a debate between my learned friend and myself about various employment appeal tribunal judgments. Uh, and I think between us, we found uh, 10 or more employment appeal tribunals judgments dating back to about 2001, all of which deal with this point. Uh, some of which um, are on all fours with Uber, some of which are slightly more difficult to reconcile with Uber. Uh, and we've addressed the position at length in skeleton arguments, um, but given time constraints, I I'm going to focus on the judgments of this court, which bind you, uh, but you have what I say in my skeleton arguments about how you can reconcile the key Employment Appeal Tribunal judgments um, with my submission. So the three judgments this court I'm going to focus on are the Pimlico judgment. I've shown you what Lord Ju Justice Etherton said, but I'm going to show you what Lord Justice Underhill said. The Windle judgment and the Addison Lee judgment. Uh, finally, I'm going to touch on the natural meaning of the legislation and deal with my, my ladyship's case, 
the football referee's case before concluding. So the first case I wanted to show you is the Pimlico case in the Court of Appeal, which you have at tab 18. Uh, and just to remind you, there is a judgment of the Supreme Court, but it doesn't deal with this point, save to say that it's to be left for another day. I've shown you the paragraphs of Lord Justice Everton's judgment that deal with the number of hours a week that Mr Smith had, had, to, had to work. But I also wanted to show you what Lord Justice Underhill said on this topic. Uh, so if I could take you to paragraph 126 of his judgment, which is at page 221 of the authorities bundle. Um, so 126, he says, as the second element, the company takes issue with the tribunal's overall conclusion that the contractual relationship between Mr. Smith and the company was not one of business and customer. I refer to that as a business customer issue. That's what earlier I referred to as the client customer issue. Uh, but that involves consideration of an important sub-issue, namely whether any, and if so what, contractual obligations subsisted between Mr. Smith and the company apart from those arising during the actual jobs that he undertook, and more particularly, whether he had to be available for work throughout the working week. I will call this sub-issue the minimal hours issue. And as I alluded to earlier, Lord Justice Underhill is dealing with this as part of the client-customer exception. Um, I say it's, it's more easily dealt with as part of the first element of the Uber test, um, but either way, <laughs> I win if it's a prerequisite for worker status. Sorry, if you what is? So he's he's dealing with whether an irreducible minimum of obligation is a prerequisite for worker status, but he deals with it, my lord, as part of the client customer exception, yes. rather than as part of the first element. But what if you look at the beginning of that sentence? That involves consideration of an important sub-issue, namely whether and if so what contractual obligations subsisted. So, my Lord, I'm going to come on to show you how he deals with that, but, but I'm simply making the point that, that he deals with it in a different order, as it were, and as a different part of the worker definition. That's not the, the, the point I'm um, asking for assistance on. He paraphrases that as the minimum hours issue, but yes. actually what he's, I see what he's addressing is whether any, and if so, what contractual obligations subsisted. That's how he describes it. Yes. And do you disagree with that description of the issue? No, my lord, I don't. Because there Mr Smith was under an obligation to provide a minimum of 40 hours a week. He didn't always have to do 40 hours a week, but he was obliged. <laughs> he didn't always in practice do 40 hours a week, but he was obliged to if the company wanted him to do that. You're, you're turning one element into a critical element of whether or not there are mutual contractual obligations. You're alighting on the minimum hours there, the do some amount of work in Lord Leggett's, mm -hmm. as encompassing the whole of this concept. Um, Whereas it, that's why I'm drawing your attention to whether and if so what contractual obligations. It's a, is he not referring to whether there are contractual obligations between the parties. So, so my lord, I don't think he's just asking whether there's a contract, whether there are bilateral obligations. I think he's asking more particularly whether this is a inc contract within the employment field. And that's where the Lord Leggett uh, uh, obligation point comes in. So in other words, in order for it to be a contract within the employment field, there has to be an obligation to do some amount of work. So I, I do say, my Lord, that that is him asking this question. And the particular focus on the facts of this case had been about the number of hours a week, which is why he refers to it as the minimum hours issue. Um, so, so he calls it the minimum hours issue, and he, re he returns to it at paragraph 133 of his judgment, which you have at page 223 of the authorities bundle onwards. Um, 
a paragraph 134, he explains uh, the relevance um, of this concept. So um, it really starts just um, halfway between the two hole punches. So it is clear from the passage as a whole that what she, so the employment judge, was concerned with was the nature and extent of Mr. Smith's minimum obligations, and in particular, the number of hours that he was obliged to work per week. The reason why that was relevant is that if the arrangement between the company and him was wholly casual, that would not only mean that he would not have the status of an employee worker in between particular jobs, but it would also be relevant to the assessment of whether he had that status during the actual period when he was working. And then he refers to two paragraphs of his own judgment in Windle. Mr. Linden's case before us, in line, I think, with how the case was put below, focused on the latter aspect. So in other words, that the case focused, as I understand, on the individual assignment contract. I'm not clear, and we did not have to hear submissions about to what extent, if at all, Mr. Smith's substantive claims depends on his status between jobs. Uh, he then goes on, uh, Mr. S uh, Lord Justice Underhill then goes on to consider the slightly contri um, contradictory evidence about how many minimum hours a week Mr. Smith had to do. Um, and he returns, I say, to, to the key part of his reasoning at paragraph 138. He said, and he rejects uh, Mr. Linden's submissions. He says, um, and he explains the difficulty in terms of the contractual evidence when looked at the findings of fact made by the Employment Tribunal. Uh, and he says in particular at, that, um, that the judge was entitled to treat the language, um, to try to the language of the contract, which allowed uh, the plumber to refuse certain jobs as with, with um, consistent with a minimum obligation to do a certain number of hours. Um, key part of his reasoning, I say, another key part of his reasoning is at paragraph 145. He says, second, although the argument before the tribunal and before us was couched in terms of whether Mr. Smith was subject to a legal obligation to work or be available for a minimum number of hours, it should not be assumed that if there had been no such obligation, the evidence about what hours he worked in practice would have been irrelevant. It is necessary to distinguish two separate circumstances in which the issue of whether a putative employee worker is engaged on a casual basis might arise. The first is whether the substantive claim directly depends on their enjoying employee worker status in respect to their periods of work because the claim concerns their pay or some discriminatory treatment. That's an individual assignment contract. In such a case, the question whether the engagement is casual is indeed relevant but only on the basis that it may shed light on the nature of the relationship while the work in question is being done. So that's the same point again. So the question, the obligations in relation to periods of non-work are relevant to the findings in relation to the individual assignment contract. But it is not only legal obligations that may shed light of that kind. If the position were that in practice the putative employee worker was regularly offered and regularly accepted work from the same employer, or that he or she worked pretty well continuously, that might weigh in favour of a conclusion that while working, he or she had at least worker status, even if the contract clearly and genuinely provided that there were no legal obligations either way in between periods of work. The second situation is where the claim directly depends on the claimant's status during periods of non-work, either because he or she has to establish continuity of employment or because the claim itself relates their treatment during that period. In such a case, mutuality of legal obligations is essential. So I say, makes clear there, there must be an irreducible minimum of obligations. Where do you make that clear? I don't understand which bit of this makes it clear that in a period of actual work, yes. in a period of actual work, um, there needs to be more than the actual work and not being a client. Well, my Lord, I was about to say, in relation to umbrella contracts, Oh, um, right. So, yes. Yeah. See, I mean, Uber says there has to be irreducible minimum obligation in relation to individual right. assignments. But this doesn't help on individual contracts, then, does it? Th this says, this is related to the particular, um, so the last sentence of this paragraph that I was halfway through reading out deals I with umbrella contracts. End of it, actually. Sorry? You had got to the end of it, I think. Um, in such a case, mutuality of legal obligations is essential. 
So when it says such a case, we're talking about umbrella contracts. Right, so this yeah. doesn't help on individual contracts or any umbrella ones. No, but, but you have my earlier points. I know, yes, but I just want to know what this is a submission about. Yes. So 145, not umbrella, uh, not individual contracts, umbrella contracts, and you yes. say it has the same effect. Yes. Thank you. I can deal with Windle briefly. Um, because it's already been cited in the Pimlico Plumbers' judgments. Um, Windle is, of course, a case on the discrimination legislation, which defines employment differently. And you've heard already my notes of caution in relation to that. Um, but it was cited by Lord Justice Underhill in his own judgment in Pimlico. Uh, and there he cited paragraphs 23 to 25, which is at pages 191 to 192. This is also an umbrella contract uh, and makes much the same point uh, as the Pimlico case. Um, Addison Lee, which you have at tab 21, uh, obviously I accept that's a permission judgment. Um, however, I've shown you that in that case, in relation to both individual assignment contracts and umbrella contracts, the employment tribunal considered whether there was a contractual obligation to provide a minimum amount of work. Uh, my fourth point is the natural meaning of the legislation. Uh, we have discussed this at some length. Um, but I do say, and it's at tab three if you prefer to have it in front of you while we look at this, I do say that this is a definition that, that came into effect. In, well, the regulations were made in 1998. Um, the earliest we can find uh, this exact definition um, in the legislation is the Wages Act 1986, which you have at tab one. Um, my learner friend has found an earlier definition, but in fact that definition is different. And that definition is similar to the extended uh, meaning of employment rather than a limby worker. <coughs> um, but in any event, I say that when Parliament drafted this definition, it must have, as Lord Justice Underhill said in the Byrne Brothers case, had in mind the requirements for a contract of employment. So you apply the, the same test, but what's called, what Lord Justice Underhill referred to as a lower pass mark. So it's not a different test. It's the same test, but a lower pass mark. Um, and I do say that looking at Lynn B in particular, if all that was required was a contract personally to do work, then Parliament would have said so. And the court's invited to find that the word undertake is not superfluous. The word undertake must refer, we say, to an agreement that an individual will do something. A promise to do something. Or is that not enough? Uh, a, a promise, a promise to do something. I think. Uh, yes. I promise to drive you to King's Cross if you pay me fifty pounds. Is that enough? Um, yes, you undertake to do something. Um, so those are my secondary submissions. Uh, as I said, this issue has been considered at length since two thousand one by many different, differently constituted employment appeal tribunals. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll simply have to refer you to my skeleton argument where we've dealt with some of the key cases. Um, lastly, I want to deal with my ladyship's case, um, what I've been referring to as the uh, football referee's case, but it's the case of Professional Game Match Officials Limited at NHMRC. It's at tab 22, page 309 of the bundle. Uh, I wanted to make seven brief points in relation to, to this case. Um, my ladyship will know better than I, but as I understand it, that because this was a tax case, the question for the court was the meaning of the phrase contract of service, so employment contract, but it was the meaning of that phrase contract of service under tax and social security legislation. The particular legislation at issue was the Income Tax, Earnings and Pensions Act 2003, 
and the Social Security Contributions and Benefits Act 1992. So is your submission that the phrase has a different meaning in that statutory context than um, in statutes relating to employment? Well, my lady, that appears so. Um, I'm no tax expert, but of course any legislation um, has to be interpreted in light of its own purpose, and those two pieces of legislation will have very different purposes from the working time but, regulations. But it would be incoherent if the contract of service meant something different in the tax and national insurance contribution field from in the employment field, wouldn't it? Well, well madam, employment means something different in the Employment Rights Act and in the Equality Act. Worker means something different even within the Employment Rights Act. It has many different meanings. Okay. There's an extended definition of worker. So I'm afraid, um, unfortunately, the same phrase is used again and again, but with slightly different meanings. So, so contract of service in this context has a different meaning from contract of service in the Employment That's your submission. Well, paragraph 45 of your judgment, my lady, um, sets out the particular provisions that you were concerned with. And what it says at the last sentence says section 122 of the 1992 Act defines employment as including any trade, business, profession, office, or vocation. Um, and, and madam, that does appear to take one down a slightly different path from what if one's applying the normal test under employment legislation. But much of what my lady's judgment uh, deals with is an analysis of contracts of employment. She wasn't going down another rabbit hole. She was very firmly in this rabbit I, I'm not, for one moment, my lord, so, accusing my lady of going down any rabbit holes. No, so, but the point, the serious point is, yes, they, she could have dealt with other things, but she looks at all the contracts of employment, and her analysis of contracts of employment must bind us. Well, in this case about contracts of employment, well, so, as in the tax case. My lord, the real difficulty in applying interpretation of tax legislation to the interpretation of the working time regulations. It's firstly, as I said, this is def different legislation. But secondly, as you'll be aware, my lord, for tax purposes, the position is binary. You're either employed or you're self-employed. Mm -hmm. There aren't any intermediate categories. And that is relevant, my lord, because mm -hmm. you may well find that because there are no shades of grey and no intermediate categories, the concept of employment may have a different meaning. So I do say you do need to tread very carefully between reading over any cases about tax status. But most into of the cases which I analysed in this judgment were decided before any of this um, this concept of worker was in the legislation. So it, it was a binary concept. Either you were an employee or you weren't. Well, well, madam, as I understand it, this concept of the worker has been around for a very long time. I think it went back to the mid-19th century, so there have been lots of different definitions of it, and this particular definition we think goes back to 1986, but certainly you did have lots of legislation dealing with workers in, in I think, the 1800s, but not this particular definition. Um, so you have my first point, it's about different legislation. My second point is it's about employment status, not worker status. And as I say, for sure, then. So, as I've mentioned, the question of whether there's an employment contract is a matter for the common law, whereas worker status is a creation of statutes, and applying that definition is one of statutory interpretation. Whereas here, as I understand it, the court was applying the ready mixed concrete common law test. Third position, as, as I've alluded to, is that under tax legislation the position is binary, whereas under employment legislation it's much more complex. Um, in any event, I say that some of what is said in this judgment, um, or, or there's no inconsistency, I say, with my lady's findings in this judgment uh, and our position on this appeal. So if I could refer the court to what is said in paragraph 120. <clears throat> As I understand it, there my lady found that in relation to the overarching or global contract, the tribunal was entitled to conclude that it wasn't a contract of employment 
because it didn't require PGMOL to offer work or the NGRs to do it. Uh, and my lady says that that's not a conclusion with which the upper tribunal or the court of appeal could interfere in an appeal on a point of law. And of course, exactly the same point arises in my, in our case. We say there's no minimum irreducible minimum of obligation during periods of non-work, and therefore the overarching contract can't be a workers' contract. So 120, I, I say, is absolutely on point with our case. For overarching contract. For overarching contracts. Yeah. Indeed, my lord, I know, I, I'm about to deal with individual assignment contracts. Well, hang on a minute, it's in a different statutory context. Well, what I'm saying, madam, is, is that <laughs> even if, <laughs> even if you Sorry, were I'm against me on that, forget, forget, forget I said. Anyway, so 120 you agree with. One can read it as saying the subject matter of the contract was not the offer and acceptance of work. Or you can read it in the way you would like to read it by attaching a particular label. There was no reducible minimum of um, obligation. But in either event, the absence of requirements to provide and do work meant the overarching contract wasn't a contract. We've got that. The question really <coughs> is individual contract. Indeed, my lord. And I'm about to come to that. Um, and as I understand it, the position in relation to individual contracts um, was is as described in paragraph 68 of the judgment. Uh, and there was a specific legal issue, as, under, as described in paragraph 68, is whether a provision in a contract which enables one side or another to terminate it before performance negates the mutuality of obligation, which is one of the necessary elements of a contract of employment. And as I understand it, um, uh, the Court of Appeal went went on to find, and my lady's judgment went on to find, that that in itself wasn't enough to negate an irreducible minimum of obligation. And that is a discrete legal issue as so described. But of course, that issue doesn't arise in our, on our case at all. Provided we accept that there was no finding of an undertaking to do work. Uh, not at all, my lord, it doesn't, it doesn't, invite, it doesn't um, arise uh, at all. And the reason is, is because in the tax case, there's a provision in a contract which allows for early termination. Um, but as I understand it, there was an obligation in the first place to provide some minimum amount of work. Yes, exactly. So you have an obligation, but then you have a terminal contract provides for early termination. Yes. The difference <laughs> is that in our case, there's no obligation in the first place and there's no provision in relation to early termination. That's not what the judge found as a matter of fact in our case. The judge found as a matter of fact in our case that this is a contract in which it's great if Mr Somerville turns up on the day, but he's not in any way obliged to. If That's he does turn up on the day, then he has to work under the framework agreement <coughs> and he has to work under the terms which you've seen, but he's never obliged to turn up. So that's why the distinct legal issue in the tax case, I say, doesn't arise on the findings of fact made by the employment judge. But it is critical case. to your case, I think, that you find that there was no a, a finding of fact that there was no undertaking on the part of Mr Somerville to perform services. It, it's critical. It, indeed, my lord. But, it, but it, it's a mistake, I say, to, to ignore all of the employment tribunal's findings in relation to withdrawal yeah. mm -hmm. because. Those are essentially findings that there's no obligation. There's They're not findings. So far as creation is concerned, he was entitled to refuse. What you say is that there was no finding that there was a, an undertaking to provide services for all the reasons you've said, yes. and therefore any right of cancellation is not the cancellation of a contractual obligation because there wasn't. But if you're wrong on the facts, you've had it, haven't you? Well, well but my lord, I'm not wrong on the facts because I've got a factual finding. No, it's a hypothesis. Appeals. If you are wrong, well, well, my lord. What I have is a factual finding by the employment judge, which hasn't been appealed. Yeah. There's no which you say means one thing, but if we disagree with you, you're stuck, can't you? That's all I'm wondering about is what, what we're arguing about the facts or the law. And I think it's the reading of the judgment at the well, moment. My law, with the greatest of respect, we've had the findings of fact, yes. and we've got a very clear conclusion that there's no irreducible minimum of obligation. Um, and I say what's different from the tax case is in the tax case, the referee does undertake to do the weekend or refereeing or, or whatever, but then there's a provision in relation to early termination. 
in my case, you don't get to that because there's never an undertaking in the first place. Yes, that's what you say, but another reading of the paragraphs, which you didn't take us to, like 213, back bottom half, is that the reason why there was no, as you call it, irreducible minimum of obligation, so far as this tribunal was concerned, was in relation to individual contracts only the ability to withdraw. That was the thing that they found, and we have to decide whether you're right or wrong on your reading of the judgment as a whole. That's the point between us. Well, my Lord, I'm very happy to take you to paragraph 213, but I do say that one can't isolate no, uh, got to read what, is, lot. what is said at paragraph 213. Yeah. One has to look at all of the findings of yeah. that. Um, and, and I do say you also have the Employment Tribunal's clear conclusions. Yeah. And as you will have seen from the Employment Appeal Tribunal's judgment, in the Employment Appeal Tribunal, the, agreed, the joint agreed basis was that this was a finding that there'd been no obligation to provide some minimum yeah. amount of work. And so that's, I say, a key difference between the referee's case uh, and the facts of our case, which is... Also, uh, these, just, just, I mean, this is perhaps a very small point, but are these findings of fact or conclusions of law? Because the Employment Tribunal held that contractual documents contained the actual obligation, so this wasn't a sham case. Yes. So actually, these are conclusions which flow from the interpretation of the contract, aren't they? Well... My lady, what the judge did um, is it wasn't just that the judge didn't find it was a sham case, because of course autoclens is more nuanced than that. It, it's not just looking at shams, but it's looking at what happens in practice. Uh, and what the judge did, specifically in relation to the individual assignments, is he reached findings of fact based on the written agreements, but also in relation to practice. So you have the advantage of the judge's findings in relation to both. But didn't he, didn't he hold? contract embodies the obligation. It was a true representation of the obligation. My lady, yes, he did, that's right. So, did. so actually, these are conclusions of law, not conclusions of fact, because they're about the interpretation of a written document. Well, My lady, if one's looking just at the conclusions in relation to the contract, yes, sir, yes. that's right. All right. Um, two more points just on the tax case. Um, firstly, as far as I can tell from the report, and of course my, my lady should know, know better than I, um, my, my ladyship does not appear to have been referred to the Uber case. That may well be understandable because the case was about the meaning of employment contracts under tax legislation, but it's of course a key distinguishing factor from this case. But it, but it wasn't relevant. How, how is the Uber case relevant to the issue in Well, My lady, I as I understand it, the, a lot of the argument between, um, for you was about uh, the meaning of uh, mutuality of obligations for employment contracts. Um, so certainly Uber would have been highly potentially highly relevant to that because it, it deals with the meaning of Neververe and also deals, deals with the meaning of Carmichael. But because Uber is, of course, well, the case about... it doesn't deal with the meaning of either. It just it purports to endorse both cases, and we were referred both to Nevermere and to Carmichael. Well, there we go. My ladyship, you, 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 as far as I can tell, you didn't so have the benefit the of Uber. From the point of view of employment, whether or not there's a contract of employment, Uber has nothing to add to what's in Nevermere and Carmichael. Does it? Well, my ladyship, arguably, yes, because you have the analysis of what the Uber drivers have yes, to but do. But it wasn't a case about a contract of employment. Well, in any event, madam, that, that's another... Um, a distinguishing point about this. And um, finally, on the um, on this case, as I understand it from leading counsel for the revenue, um, an application for petition to appeal to the Supreme Court was made in December, but we don't know the outcome of that application yet. Are we bound by this then? So to conclude my submissions, um, firstly on ground one. I say that this court is bound by Uber to decide that an irreducible <coughs> minimum of obligations is a prerequisite for worker status, not just a relevant consideration, as my learned friend contends. And I say, in any event, um, in light of what is said in Pimlico, Windle and Addison Lee, and taking account of the natural meaning of the words used by Parliament in Regulation 2.1, um, that the court is obliged to find in my favour. Accordingly, I say that the Employment Tribunal is wrong to consider that the claimant could satisfy 
the Limby definition, given its finding of fact that there was no irreducible minimum of obligation under either the overarching or the individual contract. And therefore, the only lawful and proper conclusion on the facts found by the Employment Tribunal was that Mr. Somerville was not employed as a worker under a workers' contract. So I invite the court to set aside the Employment Tribunal's judgment and to substitute an order to that effect. Ground two, as I showed you earlier, is a small point in relation to paragraph 242 of the judgment. My ladyship has already indicated that she doesn't think that this is what the judge did intend to mean, but if the judge intended to suggest that mutual obligations in the sense of bilateral obligations was sufficient to satisfy the Limby worker test, then I say that's obviously wrong for the reasons I've described. Um, so again, I would uh, invite the court to set aside the tribunal's judgment and substitute an order that the claimant was a worker. Uh, unless I can assist the court any further, those are my submissions. No, no, thank you. No, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Chair. My lords, my lady, I'm going to start by answering the question that my lord posed at the outset of the case. The claim in the housing the schedule of loss produced in November 2020 is in the sum of £22,582. Now, that may have to be adjusted. There may be an error of calculation, but it's in that order. It runs from the last year, 2019-2020, back to 2012-2013, and it's for unpaid holiday pay under Regulation 16 of the Working Time Regulation, and there's an unauthorised deduction from wages. And, and how, do you get the, how do you get that amount? A series of 4,000 a year, roughly. What are you saying? That if he worked nine days a year, he's entitled to four well, weeks he's and pro five days of £250, or whatever it is. Yeah, he, he's pro-rated it according to the number of days he worked in that particular year. So, for example, and again, again I stress these may change, but in the year 2012-2013, the claim he earned, he sat for 78 days, he earned £26,600, and his claim for holiday pay is £2,900. By contrast, in his last year, he sat for one day, he earned £367, and his claim for holiday pay is £40.58. So he's pro-rated it in right. relation to, to that. So you take, just as he, for, you assume it's five days working for X number of weeks a year, he works out how many days he's been working, and works out an hourly equivalent, and then applies it to the day sat. Yes, it, it, that, that's correct. Um, and uh, we've got a copy of yesterday's judgment from this court in the Pimlico Plumbers case, which now makes it clear that you can roll up, as it were, but you can roll up, right? all of that. Uh, and will it matter if he's not an employee, well, uh, not a worker, under an overarching contract, that there'd be periods of time when he's not, or does this all simply depend on the days he actually worked? Our view, our primary case is it doesn't matter, that he can now roll up all of the assignments he's had over the previous eight years and be paid holiday pay at the end of that period. Irrespective of the period when there was no contract? Yes, irrespective of that. Right. Because um, under the Section 23 of the Employment Rights Act, they're just, uh, that, that provides up to an authorised deductions, um, and also under the decision yesterday makes clear right at the end of that decision the conclusion of the Court of Appeal determining uh, that um, you can roll up all of your holiday pay at the end if you haven't been paid it and you never took it and you didn't know you had the right to take it and you were never told you had the right Even to take it. Even if there are gaps? Even if there are gaps. Even if there are gaps, right. That's our, that's our understanding. However, okay. we are not abandoning, I mean clear, the overarching contract. We we we, right. we we aren't we aren't we aren't content to, to abandon that point because who knows what may happen in that field of legislation from here on in. So um, that's the position, and we have copies of Pimlico if necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but turning to the the matters in hand, the further one gets away from the word of the statute, the more complicated matters become. So it's always better, in my submission, to look at the wording of the statute. One's reminded in this case of the words of Lady Hale in Bates van Winkelhoff, which is to the effect that it's uh, curious how much effort has gone to establish this claimant is not a worker when he fulfills, we say, the criteria. 
Um, the other thing that I mentioned right at the outset, which is often lost sight of in the case law, is that a worker is a self-employed person. He is a species of self-employed person. Quite often there's a, a honing in to the employment relationship when actually he's a self-employed person. He can pick and choose or she can pick and choose when they work. And it's the tension that has existed in the case law which seems to drag more and more people, as it were, into a closer employment relationship when at the heart of it, I don't want to take it too far because of course there is a distinction made between the genuinely self-employed as it turned and those who are semi-detached but at the heart of this he is self-employed as a worker taxed as a self-employed individual so I, I make that point at the outset so we don't lose sight of it I'm going to address my lord my lady in three ways, firstly I'm going to deal with the position on individual assignment, I'll take that reasonably quickly then I'm going to deal with the position in relation to the overarching contract. And then I'll deal with Uber, which doesn't have, we say, the weight that my old friend seeks to attach to it. So we start with the overarching, sorry, with the individual contract. And we start with the wording of the statute. It's in the authority of Thumble. It's uh, neither to tab two or tab three. Both the same, I'll take tab three. Start uh, with the definition of work. Now, it's important just to reflect firstly on what the preamble words say. Because the preamble words say the worker means an individual has entered into or works under, or where the employment has ceased work. Now, what we have here is we don't get through the gate into A and B unless you have contract relating to work. So in the first part of the uh, words of that statute, you need to establish that you are either working under or have worked under. Now if we take this case as an example, Mr. Somerville does his uh, sitting, he finishes his sitting, uh, at the end of that assignment he has worked under a uh, contract. Then we get to the second part, that can either be a contract with employment, or it can be any other contract, whereby the individual undertakes to do or perform personally any work or service. Well, we know it has to be work, because that's already been said in the preamble. The undertaking, the significance of the undertaking, is personal service. In other words, he has, uh, he has to undertake that work person. He can't send a substitute. And indeed, the, the, the case law, and it is a raft of case law, different factual circumstances, uh, all of which uh, to some degree try and gloss or uh, re reinterpret the stuff. It's actually, in my submission, quite straightforward. You have to have a contract relating to work. You have to have a contract relating to personal service where the individual has undertaken personal service. And you, haven't, you can't be a client or customer of that person. I don't see yet where your first bit comes from. It must be a contract relating to work. The opening words, although there is the word employment in parenthesis, simply says you have to have entered into or worked under certain things which are to come. So it doesn't say relation to work. Well, well it says the word work, works work, under, or work, worked under. Well, yes, yes but it, that, that's my, sorry, forgive me, my lord. That's my, that was my okay. basic point that I was making. That, that reference to works under means you are working under that contract. You don't work under a sale of goods contract. You don't work under a carriage of goods contract. Okay, you right. work under a fair enough, contract, yeah. Which, which uh, deals... Don't name it, I've got it now. Yeah. So, sorry, uh, um, and. There is no sensible dispute, I don't think there is a dispute, that one takes Mr. Summerville's position. In, in the unlikely event, he sat for a hearing, two or, one, two or three day hearing, and the NMC didn't pay him, he could sue for the money he wasn't paid. And again, in the unlikely event, that he committed some egregious 
wrongdoing while he was sitting. He took a bribe or harassed the registrant or did something unlawful. The NMC could sue him for any damage they suffered. There can't be any sensible um, uh, uh, contest on that. There are mutual obligations when he is sitting. And he is in, when he is sitting, he is a person who is working under a contract. He is doing that personally, and he isn't a client or customer of the NMC. So they are not his clients. I'm going to start in the authorities where my learned friend finished, because my submission is that uh, the professional game match officials case really is the start and beginning and end of this point. My lord called it illuminating, without wishing to sound toading, I would say, the penetrating analysis on the issues, and really on the question of the role, if any, of what's become known as the irreducible minimum, it's absolutely plain what the law is from that judgment. It is the latest judgment of this court. It's the last in time. It's the most relevant. Um, the attempts by my own friend to distinguish that case with respect smacked of some desperation. It is a recipe for disaster if one starts to think there are going to be different contracts of service in the tax field. Now how does this help us then? Well, this helps you if I can take you um, to, to it in perhaps in some detail. So we we start um, at paragraph four. The judgment itself in, in the in the authorities bundle starts at tab twenty two. Paragraph four identifies the issue. So did the first year tribunal earn its conclusions in relation to mutuality of obligation in the overarching contract? and also in the individual contract. So we see immediately the issues in play are the questions of mutuality in respect of an individual contract of employment and an individual, um, an overarching contract. The detailed findings uh, start at paragraph 10 of the first tier tribunal, but I don't need to take you through all of those, but there are a few which I'll just pick out. The first is paragraph at 21, in 315 of the authorities bundle. Match appointments were offered to the referees on the MOAS, which is the software system, on the Monday of the relevant week by the management, the operation management team. They took into account suitability, availability, benefits, any conflict of interest, and so on. Once appointments are allocated, referees can accept them. They can reject an appointment if they're no longer available. Although PGML will want to understand why. The next sentence is crucial. Changes can be made after an appointment is accepted. If a referee, a referee may suddenly get ill or have an unexpected work commitment. Read that across. Mr. Thummel may have an unexpected hearing in court which he has to attend <clears throat> after he's made the agreement as these <coughs> referees. Paragraph 27, the following page, right at the end of that page. Sorry, which paragraph? Paragraph 27, my lord. Thank you. Um, the code of practice stating he would not be an employee and would be treated as self-employed and then the final sentence Code of practice is a short document, etc. It says that appointments are made by PGML and there is no guarantee that officials on the list will be offered any appointments or matches. And if it's not obliged to accept any appointments offered to them. So we have a direct similarity with this case. Then moving through the judgment, um, moving to paragraph 50, which is um, at page 321, just in fact, slight number the previous page, my, my lady starts to analyse the case law. On 49, she states, I can illustrate the main points by referring to three decisions of the Court of Appeal and one of the House of Lords. The first is Mick Meekin. We've already looked at that. The relevant passage for our purposes is on the following page. Uh, paragraph 
55. There was a new argument in that case run by the claimant in the Court of Appeal that he had an individual contract. I ought to say, by way of correction, Malone and Friends summary of the facts, the parties to the appeal were the claimant and the Secretary of State. The claim was under the National Insurance Fund for, because the agency had gone bust. It wasn't a payment from the third party. So the Secretary of State did not object to the new argument, made three submissions in response. If the general engagement, i.e. the overarching contract, was not a contract of employment, there could be no contract of employment in respect of a single stint. Even if one was not a general rule, it was a proposition which applied to the present case. If a single stint could, in theory, give rise to a contract of employment, the absence of mutual obligation to provide and to do work was fatal to its existence. That's what's being said in this case. Lord Justice rejected submission one, and then he went on to say this. Where the claim related to pay for a single stint, it was logically to relate the claim for employment status to the particular job of work in respect of which payment is sought. He quoted the textbook. In fact, that's Harvey on industrial relations. The better view is not whether the casual worker is obliged to turn up for or do the work, but if he turns up for and does the work, whether he does so under a contract of service or for services. There was nothing in Congress in holding that in this case. Over the page, we have a bit more detail, paragraph 57. A single stint for the four days of work in January. The question was whether the assignment amounted to a contract of service in its own right. And then the key paragraph, or the key sentence, are the conditions which exclude mutuality were irrelevant in this context. There is your point there, that it's the doing of it under a legally binding arrangement that is enough, not the having to enter into a legally binding arrangement to do it. If you do the work and are paid, as my lady said later in the judgment, that is sufficient. Clark and Octor cited, I won't take too much time in relation to that. The only point of note is that in that case, the Court of Appeal overturned the Employment Appeal Tribunal, finding that there was an overarching contract because of the absence of mutuality, but then turned its attention to individual contracts, and it was accepted that the Employment Tribunal hadn't dealt with that issue. The implication being that the absence of mutuality didn't prevent the remission back to the Employment Tribunal. Carmichael is then mentioned in paragraph 60, and dealt with. I don't think I need to trouble the Court with that, it's a well-known decision. And then over at the bottom of page 32465, Prater is addressed. Significantly, in Prater, the judgment of Lord Justice Mummery, which is summarized by my lady, starts at paragraph 66. The mutuality created by Mrs. Prater being contractually obliged to work during each successive engagement was not the same mutuality necessary to constitute the irreducible minimum. The distinguishing there between working and the offer as future work. My lady then observed that Lord Justice Mummery rejected the arguments and explained why the authorities did not support it. He summarized the position in five propositions. They included that under each contract, Mrs. Prater was engaged and was paid to teach pupils. It made no difference that the council was not obliged to offer her more work at the end of each engagement, or she to accept it. The important point was that once a contract was entered into, and while that contract continued, she was under an obligation to teach the pupil. And then my lady moves on to paragraph 68. A distinct legal issue is whether a provision in a contract that enables one side or another to terminate it before performance negates the mutuality of obligation, which is one of the necessary elements of contract employment. I'll come back to that point in due course. Then moving through the judgment, picking up paragraph 70, the first year tribunal's legal reasoning is analyzed. 
In relation to that, the only point I would draw attention to is paragraph 80, page 3 to 8 of the bundle. Uh, and a point that on the current authorities, we accept that Windle shows that the nature of arrangements between work may, in some cases, be relevant and cast light. But I, I, I mention that in the context of this case. What is required is that the Employment Tribunal actively considers mutuality and decides whether or not it is, it is relevant and informs the character of the individual engagement. It is perfectly open to the Employment to the Tribunal to consider it and decide it doesn't uh, inform that in any way. Yes, case. it's not a prerequisite, it's, it's relevant and it's most obviously relevant when you're having one thing done every 10 years, that looks like somebody who's doing a roofing business and does it out of choice, rather than somebody who's integrated into the um, business. My lord, yes. Yep. Um, moving through the judgment, so we then get to paragraph 93, which is the start of the upper tribunal's, uh, uh, sorry, my lady's analysis of the upper tribunal's decision. Uh, the only relevant paragraphs which I draw my lord and my lady's attention to there are paragraphs 108 and 109. The upper tribunal rejected the revenue submission at the first tier tribunal's conclusion that there was no mutuality of obligation was inconsistent with the decision that there were legally binding contracts. If both sides could withdraw, there was no contract. <coughs> The upper tribunal considered there was doubt that the PGR was obliged to pay the referee if he officiated, thus as much to create a contract, albeit a unilateral contract. But it went on to say such a contract did not have sufficient mutuality to constitute an employment contract. And then at 109, the right to withdrawal is addressed. But that again is the upper tribunal's decision. But the key to this, of course, is my lady's uh, judgment, which is at paragraph 118. Warrant reading in full. Firstly, my lady starts by citing McMeekin and Clark Court of Appeal cases, Carmichael House of Lords case, and Crater Court of Appeal case, all of which bind this court. All cases in which this court consider, in one way or another, the relationship between mutuality and obligation in an overarching contract in an, and in a single engagement, they established at least three propositions. The question whether a single engagement gives rise to a contract of employment is not resolved by a decision that the overarching contract does not give rise to a contract of employment. Two, in particular, the fact that there is no obligation under the overarching contract to offer or to do work, if offered, or that there are clauses expressly negative of such obligations, does not decide that a single engagement cannot be a contract of employment. The nature of each contract is a distinct question. A single engagement can give rise to a contract of employment if work which has in fact been offered is in fact done for payment. There can be no sensible distinction between an employment contract and a workers' contract on that narrow point. So you didn't appeal the finding that there wasn't a contract of employment, though? No. And you should have, shouldn't you, if what you were saying is true. <laughs> I think I've uh, if, anyway, if we, we, we well, I, 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 I want to say in defense of my then junior, I we weren't involved. Um, no. but, uh, but, uh, on, on analysis, but logically, it applies to that, doesn't it? That part. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, we could, of course, apply to amend our. Uh, oh, I'm not asking you to do that, no. <laughs> you haven't. Um, but from what you've said, because this is contract of employment, it's not even contract of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on, on my lady's analysis, we're, we're, we're in that territory. But, yeah. Um, and, and paragraph 119 couldn't be clearer. These authorities do not support any suggestion that the criteria of mutuality of obligation is the sole qualifying test of the existence of a contract of employment. So that if there is some mutuality, but it's not the right kind of mutuality, there can be no contract of employment. On the contrary, those authorities, the other authorities which we all referred, suggest the court has to look at all the circumstances in the round deciding whether or not there is a contract of employment. The Court of Appeal in Mitnick specifically rejected the submission that effect. The Court of Appeal in Crater rejected similar submission. Um, that is, we submit, the start and end of the case on individual assignment. There's nothing more to be said because that judgment could not be clearer. Can I just ask what 
I understand the looking back position because Mr. Somerville has finished now. He's not the chairman anymore. The eight years have gone. Therefore, all we need to do is look at whether he worked under a contract. And you say it's the fact of the activity coupled with the entitlement to payment that solves it, and that's fine. I, I, I do understand that, I promise you. Leaving that to one side and moving to a different question, what do you make, or what submissions do you make about the submissions by Ms. Darwin that there was no finding that the uh, claimant undertook, firstly, to perform services in the form of attending uh, the hearings? You say there was no such finding, or you say there was a finding, well, and if there, so, there, what there was a, the activity, to put it neutrally, that he undertook to provide? There is a helpful finding at paragraph 213 in the core bundle at page 164. Yeah. After the citation of Clark and Oxfordshire Health, the, the sentence starts, in respect of each individual... In respect of each individual assignment, that could be governed, the claimant accepted the offer of the assignment. The NMC was not free to cancel without incurring all or part of the fee, and I'll come back to the findings of fact in a moment. To that extent, there was some obligation on it. But because the claimant could withdraw without sanction after the conclusion of the agreement, but before the hearing, that's mm -hmm. the key passage, before the hearing, I conclude there was insufficient mutuality. But the point there is that once he had, as it were, turned up on the day, it's absolutely clear from that point that he was then obliged to continue. It'd be a nonsense, frankly, if he wasn't subject, I guess, to the reasonable endeavours point, which is if he broke his leg during the hearing, he might be able to go off and get an ambulance and, and pass it on to somebody else. But, but is your submission that there was still an agreement right up until the time he exercised his right to cancel? Yes, that's, that, that's exactly how it is put. Uh, I think, if I recall by my lady, in in um, in uh, going back to um, the, um, the the referee's case, the PGML case, if one goes back a moment to that case, uh, it's uh, paragraph one two two. It might be useful just to turn that up, bearing in mind the factual similarity. Referees accept a date, and then having accepted it, they then subsequently cancel. So he accepted the date, i.e. he accepted that he would attend the hearing and run it as a chairman and do the pre-reading, yes. uh, unless he cancels. So that yes. was what he undertook to that's, do. That's essentially what, and, and he can, he can, uh, he, he undertook, he, 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 that's what he did. And if one looks at 122 of um, the PGML case, the first of... This is more a question of the facts of this case, not the question of what those facts mean at the moment, because well, I've been putting to Ms. Darwin that her whole case in one analysis rests on there being no finding that there was any uh, undertaking at all, and Ms. Darwin, for the reason she said, said there was an obligation. And I just want to know what you factually say the position is. And I've written down that, you, that if the... Um, when he accepted the date, he accepted that he would attend and do the hearing, subject to a right to cancel. Yes, that's that's entirely what happened. And it, it stands, frankly, to reason that's the case, because why wouldn't you turn up unless you had a good reason not to? You would, you would, you would, you it's not, not, why not? Yes, for him Under a contractual uh, arrangement to avoid... It's a contractual obligation work. for him to attend on that day and yeah. do that hearing, and sort the judgment out and produce the judgment and what the remedy would be if he didn't notify or he turned up and said, I've had enough, I'm walking out? There'd be interesting questions there. But there was a contractual requirement yes. until he, uh, to attend the hearing and do the services, unless he notified them. Is that yes. your submission, just yes. so that I've understood it? A yes. contractual requirement, that's not a, why wouldn't he, a contractual that's requirement. That's, that's right, and we see that from 213, because the claimant could withdraw without sanction after the conclusion of the agreement. That's the key part. There is an agreement, yeah. and therefore, and before the hearing. Um, so while we're on the findings of fact, it might be just worth picking up a few. We've been through most of them, but it's worth just going through them again. So, in relation to the existence of the contract, the key paragraphs start at one eight nine to one nine one, where the claimant's submission was accepted that there was both an overarching contract and 
between him and the NMC and a series of individual contracts. In relation to the former, the NMC offered to appoint the claimant to the FTP panel as a chair for four years. The claimant accepted in writing the terms are found in the letters of appointment and so on. Um, I'll come back to that just in a moment, but one point that I want to stress when I come to the overarching contract is the subsistence of contractual obligations between individual assignments. And those uh, contractual obligations, which are set out and summarised by the Tribunal of Paragraph 98 and 99, which is page 140 of the core bundle, are that he had a subsisting obligation to comply with procedures of AMC relevant members, including the Code of Conduct and Service Standards, performance feedback, procedure for addressing complaints. He was required, whether he was sitting or not, to promptly provide any assistance and information in writing required of him by the NMC. He had continuing and when one looks at them, fairly onerous obligations in relation to confidential information and data protection. And in relation to confidential information, those obligations, if one looks at the um, supplemental bundle, they subsist after the contract has ended. They, they subsist throughout the contract and after the contract. There are legally enforceable obligations, but they, the nature of 98.1 and 98.3 are not of the nature of providing work or services. They are obligations to hold yourself fit to do so and to keep secret that which you have learned in doing so. Yeah, that, that's right. Yes, I'm not, going to, I'm not suggesting that he had an obligation to work in, 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 in the gaps, as it were. That, that's no. accepted. But I do say, and I'll come back to the point, that the significance, there is a significance to those subsisting obligations. Um, just going back to the, the findings of fact in relation to the contractual position, so the next relevant findings of 218. Well, you want to show us 191, don't you? Because don't you want to submit the no, words sorry, in your sorry, mind sorry, that there is an agreement yes, there, yes. and the agreement is defined just to sit on the hearing. Yes. Uh, isn't yes. that what, well, that's, I don't know, is that what you submit it, the uh, individual agreement or yeah. individual contract for? Yes, it couldn't, it, it couldn't be clearer. Each time the NMC offered the individual and the claimant accepted, he agreed to sit on the hearing, which the NMC agreed to pay him the fee. So it, Pithy, it's direct, but it's clear. Yeah. Um, 218, page 165. So introducing or concluding rather the worker status point. 219. So the analysis of this, these two paragraphs, 218 and 219, is as follows. There must be a contract. The contract must be for which the work and say the work personally and must not be a client or customer. And the judge then says, I've already found there was an overarching contract between the claimant and the NMC. There was individual contracts when work was assigned, under which the claimant agreed to provide his services person. I understand that as a finding of fact for the individual contracts, because we've just looked at that and he's agreed to sit. I'm having some difficulty in understanding how the overarching contract, it is clearly a contract, there are binding obligations. But it's not of the nature of a contract to do work, is it? Because it's more of the nature to put yourself in a position where you're fit to do the work and where, if you do do it, you comply with professional obligations. Yes, there, there is, that's right, although there's a little more to it. There's the reading in, there's the pending training, there's all those sort of things. But the, at the risk of taking my submissions out of order, I'll deal with the point directly as my Lord's asked it. The, yeah. the, the point that we make, and here we are in agreement with Merlin's friends, is you can't divorce the overarching contract from the individual engagement. So the fact that you have an overarching contract which has within it separate contracts for individual engagement means that you have a contract where a person is personally undertaking work. He's not personally undertaking work all the time. He's not doing it all the time. He's doing it within the individual engagement. But the overarching contract can't be separated. It can't be from separated it. because it's got uh, elements which relate to the way in which the individual's contract will be carried out. But is it or is it not a contract personally to do work or services? We, we submit it is for the very straightforward reason that 
the overarching contract has a number of different obligations, including the individual contracts within that overarching contract, which is the obligation we've just discussed. To and I don't understand that, because there's no requirement to enter into an individual contract. No, there isn't a requirement to enter into an individual contract, but the, the, the but as a matter of fact, in this case, that is what happened. So if you're looking at how that contract was performed, you can't divorce it. I understand that. But if there is no sitting in existence, it's a month when he's not sitting, and nothing has been planned for the future. During that month, is he or is he not um, a worker? Because the overarching contract, which is the only thing that applies in that month, uh, a contract personally to do work or perform services. We say that he is, because in that month, there is subsisting contractual obligations on him throughout that period. They're not obligations they're, to do work. No, I accept they're not obligations to do work. I'm bound to accept that on the findings of the tribunal. There are no obligations to do work in the gap. But there are subsisting obligations which join, which are sufficient to join those gaps together by that mechanism. Because it, well, this is not a case where nothing happened. This is a case where there are subsisting obligations filling in the gap. And if one goes back to the wording of the statute, Maybe it's worth reflecting on that uh, at the moment just to, to look at this point. So you have a worker who's entered into a works under any other contract. And here we're talking about the overarching contract. And I've made the point about undertaking to perform work personally. There's no issue about that. He's performing the work personally. And he's, all, he's working under that contract because that framework, our umbrella contract, is what allows the existence of the individual contract. That's, that's how we put the case in relation to, to that point. That it's not a case where there's nothing happening between the gaps. Where Does it have a consequence as a matter of law? It may do. I'm slightly hesitant to... to I can see why my lord thinks it may not, because at the end of the day, you have to consider when he was when he was working for the for the qualification of for the calculation of holiday pay. Uh, it, it could have uh, consequences in relation to. Um, it would to show that you've done two years' work. Yes, and can claim okay. unfair dismissal. So that's that's only if you've got employment status. Yes, exactly. But so to that, it, we're not an employee status no, no, here. But but that would that would apply in those scenarios. You're not entitled to any other rights of, the, of that nature. Or there may be so, limitation problems as well, too. Well, yes, that, that is a that is holiday a pay as well. You yes. say Pimlico says you can roll them up, but if there is no work between particular periods yeah. and the first bit relates to an assignment in 2013, there may or may not yeah. be well, limitation periods. Uh, yes, or even then, though, you'd still face possibly if an unlawful rights deduction, you have to bring it within three months yeah. of that. So, there may be, is the, the highest I put it out. I'll have to give some thought later. Okay. As I understand your submission, you're, you're saying that when uh, the individual, when Mr. Somerville performs work, he is performing it pursuant to or under uh, the individual and the overarching, because they together contain his obligations. That's exactly right, my lord. And just to, to, to add to that... Or they could together com contain both sides' obligations. That, that's right, my lord. And, and really to add to that point is that there are features of the overarching contract which govern his behaviour and performance while doing his job. That I understand. It's when he's not sitting and there's no booking accepted. It's a dry month. Nothing is happening. And the question then is whether he is... Uh, working under a contract. I think the answer is, is perhaps conceptual, and it's this, that if you can't divorce the overarching contract from the individual engagement when he's doing the work, because it at least part of it governs that, how can you logically divorce it when he's not doing the work? Because if you're going to say that essentially that both contracts govern the individual engagement, you need to think about, one needs to think about how, uh, in the gaps, as it were, you can say, well, 
the, there are both contracts in place when he's doing the individual engagement, but actually we're not going to look at the individual engagement, we're going to ignore that. There are provisions in the overarching contract which are relevant to the way in which he carries out individual assignments, but the individual contract provisions do not themselves involve the doing of work or services. So unless there was in existence an individual contract, the obligations wouldn't be worker-type obligations. That's how one would no. put it. And if you look at the beginning, for example, he enters into it on the 1st of May 2012. He may not have his first sitting until the 1st of May 2013. And the question then is, as at the 1st of May 2012, has he entered into a contract for uh, work and so on? And if there is no obligation to work, perhaps the answer is no. So even no. though it's linked to the way in which individual contracts will be carried out, the overarching contract itself may or may not, depending on which view you take, uh, not involve the performance of work. Well, it's not I, itself I, I, a contract to perform work. It will condition and inform other contracts. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm bound to accept on the final tribunal that the overarching contract on its own contains no obligation. Yeah. Of the kind we do. I'm not going to try and hmm. uh, suggest otherwise. But the simple point we make is that... Because there are residual obligations yes. touching on the work. And also because they inform the individual uh, contracts, then the opposite must equally be the case. Yeah. It's not possible we submit to separate the two out. Um, well, you were looking at paragraph 120, I think. Yes, going back to the... the Sorry, forgive me, yes. Um, going back to uh, the referee's case, um, at paragraph 122, uh, it's really just to deal with this withdrawal point. My lady uh, analysed the relevant case law and said that the first of the for the first, for first year of trial, there was two main reasons for deciding there was no contract of employment as respects the individual engagement was lack of mutuality of obligations. It considered the fact that either side could pull out of the engagement before the game without any breach of contract or sanction negated the necessary mutuality. In my judgment, the FTT erred in law in deciding the ability of either side to pull out before a game negated the necessary mutuality. The authorities, the authorities which I have referred to above show this is not the correct legal analysis. And my lady then sets out the correct le legal analysis, which we entirely agree with and adopt. The correct analysis is that if there is a contract, the fact that it serves for either side to terminate the contract before it's performed without breaching it is immaterial. The contract subsists with its mutual obligation unless and until it's terminated by one side or the other. My lords, I can take you through the case law that my lady has referred to, uh, which is pretty much the case law that we were going to refer to. I don't see there's much merit in doing so. Those are our submissions on the individual, the individual Thank assignment. You. Yes. I, I think you've had my submissions now on the overarching yeah. uh, assignment. The only point that I would make in relation to that, or the only additional matter which I just draw attention to, is that is a, is, a, is a couple of page uh, references in the case law. Firstly, to the Pimlico Plumbers judgment, and we were taken earlier to paragraph 145. I just want to pick up that point, which is perhaps a <coughs> useful point to it. 145. Yes? Yeah, sorry, pa paragraph 145. It's, 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 sorry, I'll start again. It's, it's tab 18. Yes. Uh, Internal uh, or numbering rather 227, page 227, yep. paragraph 145. Thank and it's you. really at the end of that, over the page, Lord Justice Underhill said this the second situation is where the claim directly depends on the claimant's status during periods of non work, either because he or she cannot, has to establish continuity of employment or because the claim itself relates their treatment during that period. I ought to say that. Just alerts me to one point to answer my Lord's point earlier. Of course, in a worker status case, there may be a whistleblowing issue yes, or an or a Inequality Act issue in relation to the periods when the individual is silent. It says this, in such a case, 
Mutuality of legal obligations is essential, but it doesn't state that the irreducible minimum of legal obligations is essential. In other words, it doesn't say that there must be an offer to undertake work or, uh, or the acceptance of an offer to undertake work. It just states there must be some mutuality, and it rather comes back to the point that my lady mentioned in the referee's case, that not all mutuality is the same. You may have mutuality. The question is whether it's sufficient mutuality. And we would say that that passage makes it clear that you're not necessarily looking at the irreducible minimum in every scenario. You can have mutuality in a bilateral contract which is wider than that, or different to that. Um, I'll deal with Windle at this point as well. I don't think there's much dispute about the effect of Google. Um, the relevant paragraph is tab 17, page 191. Paragraph uh, 22 is where it starts, but the, the indented section, this last sentence, uh, is, is, is council submissions. The absence of mutuality between engagements had uh, nothing to that inquiry. Lord, Sorry, can you give me the sorry, paragraph again? Yes, it's paragraph 22. Thank you. Page 191. Yes. I'm just uh, picking up council submissions put in context. Oh, I see. Yes. The absence of mutuality, he said, submitted, the absence of mutuality of obligation between engagement can have nothing to be at inquiry. I, yes. Uh, Lord, just, I do not accept that submission. I accept, of course, that the ultimate question must be the nature of the relationship between the crew that work is being done. Not follow the absence of mutuality obligation outside the period may not influence or shed light on the type of relationship within it. it. Seems to me as a matter of common sense and common experience, the fact that a person supplying services only really doing so on the side of the site they tend to indicate the degree of independence, etc. But the key part is the last sentence. Its relevance will depend on the particular facts of the case. But to exclude consideration of it once uh, counter the repeated measure of that is necessary to consider all the circumstances. And just before that, the, the sentence reads, it will not always do so, and nor did the ET so suggest. In other words, there is no, contrary to the grounds of appeal in this case, there is no uh, universal rule that you have to have mutuality of obligation in the sense we've been discussing in, uh, in every case in relation to an individual site. Or indeed, we would say in relation to the workers' contract generally. I now turn to Uber, um, where um, my own friend says that has radically changed the law. But the three days my lady spent in the Court of Appeal hearing the PGML case, having every case conceivably cited to her, with experience leading counsel before her, my lady of the somehow missed this radical change in the law, which Uber has now set in train. Um, it's important, and it will take a little bit of time to do this, to actually understand the structure of the Uber decision. And the authority starts at 20 in the, in the bundle. It's an individual assignment case, not an overarching contract case. It was accepted that when the app was not on the, in that case, unlike this case, the drivers had no obligation at all. But I pick up the judgment of paragraph 41. So that is where the main issue is identified. And the three requirements of the Limby contract are set out. Contract where an individual undertakes to perform work or services. 42, this concerns that requirement. And the issue was who was the contract with? Was it with, between the drivers and the customers? Or was, was it between the drivers and Uber? Moving through the judgment, at paragraph 45, um, Lord, just, sorry, Lord Leggett um, addressed the question of whether Uber was acting as a booking agent. We can pass through that just note in passing that he in fact found that that would have been sufficient <coughs> to defeat the case on its own, but nevertheless he then went on to consider the auto cleanse case, paragraph 58 page 279 
And it runs through various aspects of that, all the way up to paragraph 70. I just draw your attention to paragraph 69 and 70. I won't read those to my, my lord and my lady, but they just uh, set out the relevant approach to dealing with worker status cases. Um, paragraph 71, the uh, judgment then deals with the purpose of protecting workers. I've set out in my skeleton argument that whilst we accept that this legislation in part is aimed at vulnerable workers entitled to national minimum wage and so on, it is far from restricted to that category. It includes rights to holiday pay, it includes protection for whistleblowing, which may be particularly important in the regulated, and some may say highly paid profession. So it's not simply the vulnerable, uh, low-paid worker uh, in a precarious position who has to be protected by this legislation. And if we move I mean, the short point is there's nothing in the language of the regs that suggests that it's aimed directly at vulnerable, low-paid workers. Right. Precisely, my lady. Um, then we move through to paragraph 79, which deals with contracting out. I can pass over that. Then at paragraph 83, applying the definition of worker, and the uh, Lord, Lord Leggett then deals with that. Then at paragraph 90, and this is where the case becomes, we say, material and particularly interesting. Starting with paragraph 90, you can note the observation that claimant drivers in the present case had in some respects a substantial measure of autonomy and independence. In particular, they were free to choose when, how much, and where to work. It doesn't suggest there that Lord Leggett was identifying any minimum obligation on the part of the drivers at that point. If we forget the word minimum for the moment, it may be no more complicated than this. Provided the contract is to do driving, it's capable of being within it. When, how much, and where. If it's not a contract to do any driving, then it wouldn't be a contract to do uh, work or services. And maybe that's all Lord Leggett was saying at 126. Providing the obligation is to do something that constitutes work or services, then it's okay. But he's not saying it's got to be some sort of special minimum obligation that flagged up. Anyway, so then moving over the page to paragraph 91, it's well established and not disputed by Uber that the fact that the individual is entirely free to work or not, and there is no contractual obligation to the person whom the work is performed when not working, does not preclude the finding that the individual is a worker or indeed an employee. Log lay cites precisely the same authority that my lady cited in the referee's case. The only qualification is the one we've already addressed, the Windle qualification at the end of the indented passage. If, that, if those two references weren't clear enough, we have a further reference at paragraph 93. In all respects, the finding of the employment tribunal justified its conclusion that although free to choose when and where they were, at the time when they were working, that was work for and under contract with Uber. And then Lord Leggett sets out five aspects of the case why he says that is a correct analysis. I don't need to take uh, you through those. Um, there is then, from paragraph 103, a discrete passage dealing with booking agents. I don't need to tell you with that. And then, uh, from paragraph 109, a section dealing with minicab drivers, which at first blush may not seem to be relevant, but there is a relevant part to that. Uber are essentially saying, look at Mingley and Pennock, look at the case of Khan, which follows later in their judgment, we're the same as the respondents in that case. We are booking agents. We should be treated the same. That's not the point to which I wish to refer, my lord and my lady. The point about Mingley is in, in that case, as a reason for rejecting the 
claim of permissible zero rates relations that extend the definition under what is now Section 82 of the Equality Act. One of the reasons was, this is paragraph 110, about halfway down, there was no obligation to work. When he chose to work, the driver was obliged to wear a uniform. And the Court of Appeal, paragraph 111, affirmed the decision. Lord Justice Kaye, with whom Martin Norse and Lord Justice Buxton agreed, regarded it as fatal to the claim that the claimant was free to work or not to work at his own whim or fancy, and held the absence of an obligation to work placed him beyond the reach of what Section 78, which is the equivalent provision, provision under the Race Relations Act. Paragraph 113, Lord Leggett said this, it's not necessary for present purposes to express any view on whether the Mingley case was correctly decided. I do not accept, however, the fact that the claimant in that case was free to work as and when he chose was a sufficient reason for holding at the times when he was working that he was not employed and the contract to do work preferred. So we have four examples, four incidents in this judgment where Lord Leggett is addressing the question of the obligation to do, to offer work and the obligation to undertake work for profit. And in each of those four occasions is saying they are not determinative of whether you have a worker's contract. Despite those four occasions, a learned friend alights on the latter section of the judgment, starting at page uh, 296, paragraph 121, and in particular paragraph 126, uh, and somehow suggests that Lord Leggett has forgotten all of what has gone before, but now reintroduces the requirement of an irreducible minimum uh, at this stage of the analysis. That is to misread this judgment, because it's clear that what in fact is happening is that at this point, Lord Leggett is grappling with working time. When is the individual uh, driver at work? And of course, he's obviously at work when he's driving, just as the, Mr. Summer is obviously at work when he's doing his sitting. The more difficult question, which doesn't arise in this case, but what arose in that case, is what happens when he switches on the app before he gets his first job? Is he at work or is he not at work? And that is why it was necessary in that case, but not in this, to consider the nature of the obligation in that interim period of time. That is the distinguishing feature. That is the reason for that passage at 126. That is uh, the only reason for it. It doesn't bear the weight that the learned friend seeks to suggest that it does. And if that weren't clear enough, it was made crystal clear in Addison Lee, tab 21, Paragraph 13, in which the specific paragraph, you can see that from the introductory words, Mr. Jeans, leading counsel, notes that the Supreme Court held me that the right to refuse is not critical, provided there is at least an obligation do some work. That's taken directly from 126. Lord Justice Bean says, I do not think it is reasonably arguable in the sentence just quoted that Lord Leggett was saying there was an obligation on Uber drivers to do a minimum number of hours. Indeed, Mr. Jeans accepted an oral argument that Lord Leggett was only referring, was referring only to times when each Uber driver was logged on. And then Lord Justice Bean goes on to observe that it was absolutely central to the Uber arrangement, paragraph 96, that drivers had the freedom to choose when and where to work. There was nothing in the Uber Welcome Pack or other provisions of more elaborate documentation that imposed a minimum number of hours. He then goes on to say, if that were the simple answer to the case, the hearing in Uber or the hearing in the present case 
would have been very short indeed. And all of the points would be irrelevant. And it is inconceivable that leading counsel, Miss Rose Faruba, would not have stood up at some point from the Employment Tribunal to the Supreme Court and said, well, actually, this case fails because of the lack of irreducible minimum of obligation. So it's, um, it is, in my submission, wholly misreading a rumour to latch on to that judgment and to suggest that that, so, that somehow imports a requirement which doesn't appear in the wording of the statute, which has never been regarded as being essential, we only have to look at Windle for that, um, to somehow suggest that to change the law. And although it's a commission decision, Paul Justice being expressly says he gives permission for the judgment to be cited, which yes. is the sideline. Yes, it did. Yeah. That's exactly it. Does. That's why we, we put it in. It's an important point. And, uh, it's, the, the, the important point about that you, is you have logists has been steeped in employment law, two leading employment law councils before him arguing the point, coming to a reasoned decision. I think, to be fair, Mr. Siegel, who was present when the formal written submission was in. Oh, forgive me. That may be, that may be better than being Yeah, it's that true. Be better than the thing here, Lloyd, I wonder if it comes to this. If he's sitting in his car and he's taking a booking, then you know he's undertaking the forms of work because you know there's a passenger in the back. But if he's sitting there with his machine turned on, you don't know if he's taking his wife or partner to Tesco's or whether he's doing any work. If you're trying to work out what the position is in that period, so the question is, you test whether he's performing work, either by seeing if he's actually doing it for somebody or by whether he's compelled to do it for somebody. Of That's course. the situation. But that is a reflection of the nature of cabbing. Whereas if you're dealing with this case, if he's agreeing to go to the tribunal, he's only agreeing to go to the tribunal on that date for one thing only. The, it wants, it's, one also has to be cautious about reading across facts. Yes. If we're going to read across any facts in, the, in cases that we've been looking at, uh, Mr. Somerville is a referee. He goes to a tribunal and decides the rights between two parties. And he uh, can cancel before that, if having made the agreement, if he needs to. But once he takes on the task, he sends and he's obligated to do it. It's precisely the same material facts as my, my lady analysed in the case mm -hmm. to which we've been looking at in some detail. But he's actually a worker, you see, not just, on your case, I think, from when he turns up at the tribunal, He's getting the hundred pounds for the pre-reading, and you presumably want to build that into your yes. calculation for the holiday pay as well. So I think you've got to go back a bit earlier. And he's saying he's not simply a worker when he does the work. He's a worker, I think you're saying, but I'm not sure, from the time that he accepts by email or phone the booking, unless and until he cancels it. That's um, that's paragraph one forty. Thank you. When booked for a hearing, page 148 of the core bundle. When booked for a hearing, the papers were sent to the claimant in electronic form before the hearing. He was required, required to do any pre reading for which he was paid a set fee. So we already have, prior to the attendance on the day, the bilateral arrangement at that stage. He could do this whenever he wished. He required equipment to conduct that pre-reading, etc. he had to provide it himself. It's not simply the attending. No. It, the trigger point is the agreement, I accept that date, the hearing on that date. You say from that point onwards, he's entered into a contract, yeah. and you say it's easy when you're looking back, because he will have worked under a contract. And that's, that's important, because it will be necessary, we submit, if the start of the engagement is the acceptance of um, the booking, then it'll be necessary to consider the time spent undertaking that work and the time spent sitting uh, in order to work out any entitlements that he had. And if he did the reading and then he cancelled because he was ill or something, he'd still get the fee for the reading, would he? I don't know the answer to that, but no. paragraph 210 deals with cancellation fee. That's page 163. That's for the hearing, though, I think. Yeah, once an agreement, once an agreement the claimant undertake a particular had been concluded, the claimant did the hearing, 
the MC was obliged to pay if the year was cancelled. There was an obligation to respond to pay if the penalty that was refused. But it's, it doesn't, there are no findings of fact. It would be inappropriate for me to be asking to someone what the position was. But if you've done that, I suspect there may be an argument. I, think, I suspect that's what it's like. I suppose it didn't happen, actually, because if you've done the reading, you probably would do the hearing, but it's possible it could yeah. happen. Yes, it's possible. And you may feel if you've done the reading but haven't done the hearing, whether you're entitled to it or not, as a person of honour, yeah. you wouldn't insist on being paid because somebody else has got to do it. Anyway, yeah. not this case. Yeah. Might, we know an individual improvement things, but unless you persuade us that in periods when there was no individual assignment, but there was still the overarching contract, which had obligations relevant to any work that was at some stage to be undertaken, you might lose. You could win on the individual, but not the overall, but you say it doesn't matter. Well, we, our primary case before the tribunal would be it makes no difference. Yeah. Because all of his holiday entitlements roll up to the end and he's entitled to be paid yeah. for all of the unpaid holiday. But, um, I'm reluctant to give that point up mm. for the reasons I've already explored. I just yeah. finished the findings of fact by looking at paragraph 243, which is, is, is quite clear. Um, I've concluded that the claimant entered into a contract with the MC whereby he undertook personal to perform one of the services for it. Standing back, and I just make the point, and I've made it in my skeleton argument, that the court just needs to, in a sense, take a step back and reflect on what its role is in looking at findings of fact of a specialist tribunal. And the, there is uh, what we have here, and I don't need to take my laws my name through it, but a very well put together judgment where the uh, tribunal addresses different aspects, different features of the case, rules some in, rules some in, rules some out. Says some are fanciful, says some <coughs> have merit. Does the proper exercise which this tribunal was required to do, does it conscientiously and comprehensively? And in order to set aside a finding, then unless there's an error of law, it has to be a perversity point, and there's no, there's no appeal on that point. So I just invite the, 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 this court just to reflect on its, on its position in terms of its, its powers of interfering with the specialist tribunal in that sense. Um, I'll just check my notes to see if there's anything else that I need to add. Just that order is fixed in the preliminary issue and the preliminary code. There's an order of the 29th of January, I think, fixing the terms of the preliminary issue. And we did raise it before the lunch hour. If we could get that order, it doesn't have to be today. But Forgive me, my Lord. Can I just be clear? Are you referring to a preliminary hearing which occurred before the um, preliminary hearing? Um, Determining the order fixing status. this preliminary hearing. So it's a, a case management discussion. Paragraph 8, page 125. 24th of January 2019, uh, there was a hearing and that listed a further preliminary hearing. I'm trying to find out what the terms were of the hearing that was listed. Indeed, my lord. I'm sure we can get you that order. You? Um, I don't remember its exact terms, but, but I don't think it will be particularly illuminative. Yeah, From memory, it will say something along the lines of the tribunal will determine worker status and employment status. I, I bet, <laughs> but I'd like to see it. I, I've, got, I've got it in front of me, my lord. It's an uh, order dated the 24th of January 2019. I, I'll make sure it's sent to the tribunal. Could you? Thank you. But it, it just... Um, uh, it says this in paragraph 3. The first issue that needs to be dealt with is the issue of employment status. <laughs> that's pretty much it. There's a bit oh, more right. to it, but doesn't okay. really, I'd have to read it carefully myself, but that's essentially. Yeah. That, I'd like to see that yeah. on the Pimlico judgment yes. that uh, came out yesterday. Oh, yes. The one that said you could ruin everything yes. else. Yes. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Just whilst that's open, my lord, it, it may be just useful just to pick up the point in the Pimlico code judgment that is relevant here. And it's right at the end. I'm not going to go through the Oh, and he just has to do the things in this as well. <laughs> uh, paragraph 102, right at the end, the conclusion. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll invite my lord. I don't need to read it for yourself. I don't think very familiar with it, but um, one can see from that how this case for 
and pay hold rate payers get a positive discount. Right, thank you. That's the only paragraph. That's the only paragraph. Thank you. Uh, my Lord, unless, my Lady, unless I can sit in the No, thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Darwin. Thank you very much, my Lord. Um, my learned friend, of course, reminded this court, as it will be well aware, that it can't interfere with the findings of fact made by the Employment Tribunal, uh, but at the same time made a rather valiant, uh, valiant attempt to re argue the facts. Um, you will have seen that there was a similar attempt not by my learned friend, but by the claimant himself, in the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which was stopped by the Employment Appeal Tribunal judge at paragraph 95 of the Employment Appeal Tribunal's judgment, where she said that she didn't accept Mr Somerville's alternative contention that in any event the judge made an implicit finding that an irreducible minimum of obligation existed in relation to each agreed occasion when he arrived to conduct a hearing. And that read too much into one, two, three. Uh, and in any event, wasn't how Mr. Somerville had argued his case below. Um, we are, unfortunately, uh, looking at how Mr. Somerville argued his case below and the findings of fact made by the Employment Tribunal below. Um, which brings me to my next point, which is that my learned friend accepts, as I understand it, that in his words, the referee's case has direct similarity to Mr. Somerville's case. Um, indeed, um, he said that Mr. Somerville's case was indistinguishable from some of the arguments uh, dealt with in the referee's case. And he took the court to paragraph 120. But, but in the referee's case, the paragraph 120, the argument by the revenue that an umbrella contract didn't need an irreducible minimum of obligation was rejected. Hmm. Similarly, my learned friend has to accept, on the findings of the fact by the Employment Tribunal, that there aren't any obligations to provide work during periods of non-work. He refers to various other subsisting obligations, but he doesn't say there's any obligation to provide work. So it follows, my lord, my lady, I say, that on the umbrella contract, uh, Mr Somerville has to lose. He can't, that can't be a work contract. And I also say that the individual assignment contract can't be a worker contract. In relation to uh, my learned friend's attempts to re-argue the fact, he also, as I understood it, attempts to adopt the arguments made by the revenue in the referee's case. But of course, it's not open to him to do that. There isn't a cross appeal in this case. And he can't suddenly adopt HMRC's arguments. In any event, for the reasons that we've already discussed, the tax case isn't, uh, the facts of the tax case are not uh, on all fours with the facts in this case. My learned friend relied on Windle and Pimlico, but when doing so, he misstated what those cases say. They don't say the question of whether there's an irreducible minimum of obligations under the umbrella contract is relevant in general. They deal with a specific question about whether the question of whether there's an irreducible minimum of obligation under the umbrella contract is relevant to whether an irreducible minimum of obligation exists under the individual contracts. And I would simply invite the, the court to reread the sections of Pimlico and Windle, um, which I've already taken you to, so that you can see Lord Justice Underhill's uh, comments in full. Uh, and I note that if he was saying that it's no more than a question of, it's no, if he was saying no more than it might be relevant, then he wouldn't have gone on to say that it's essential. Fourth point is what my learned friend said about the right to counsel. He referred you 
to paragraph 120 of the referee's case, uh, which is in relation to the cancellation issue. And he referred you to paragraph 124 of the Uber judgment, which is also the cancellation issue. And he said, well, in both of those cases, the referees and the drivers could cancel a job. And he said, as the court said in both those cases, that the fact that you can cancel doesn't mean it was a workers' contract in the first place. And of course that's right. But it doesn't mean that Mr Somerville doesn't need to establish that the individual assignments were workers' contracts. My learned friend made a number of, alternative, number of suggestions for alternative definitions for Limby worker status. So first of all, he suggested an alternative definition for worker status, whereby all you needed to show was a contract under which you could sue. But of course, one needs more than a contract. You need a contract, but you then also need a contract under which you've undertaken to provide some work. The second alternative definition for Limby worker status he suggested was a contract in relation to work. But of course, all sorts of people work under contracts in relation to work that, that aren't Limby worker contracts. And then finally, he suggested that all, was, all that was needed was a contract for personal service. But again, that can't be right. And we know from paragraph 41 of the Uber judgment that that's the second element of the definition. But you need the first element, which is the contract under which you undertake to do work. He referred you my learned friend referred you to a definition taken from Harvey, cited in the McMeachin case, which is at page 52 of the authorities bundle. And it, it's a letter G. It says, the better view is not whether the casual worker is obliged to turn up for or do the work, but rather if he turns up for and does the work, whether he does so under a contract of service or for services. And I agree that that may be an easier way to look at it. But what this is not saying is you can take away, you don't need to concern yourself with whether that particular contract contains the legal, legal obligation to undertake work. It's simply looking at it from a different lens. My learned friend also suggested that the definition of a LIMB contract has a different meaning depending upon the type of contract. And again, it can't be right that Regulation 2.1 differs in meaning according to the type of contract that it applies to. This was, I think, his attempt to rescue uh, the umbrella contract, uh, where he suggested that the umbrella contract, all that was required was mutuality of obligations in the sense of bilateral obligations um, such that a contract is formed. But it, but it can't be right that if you need an irreducible minimum of obligations under the individual assignment contract, that that's not required for the umbrella <coughs> contract. Then I want to deal finally with what my learned friend said about uh, Uber and Addison Lee, because I'm concerned uh, that by misstating both of those authorities, he risks leading this court into error. Um, firstly, dealing with what was said in the Uber case about the Minfley taxi case. Tab 20 of the authorities bundle and the particular passage of the judgment that my learned friend took you to that deals with ministry is at Yes, 
sorry, forgive me, it's at paragraph 110, which is at page 294. And my learned friend said that what Lord Leggett said um, dealing with the, the Mintley case, so particularly at 110, 111, 112, and 113, was Lord Leggett saying that one doesn't need ever irreducible minimum of obligations for there to be a limb B contract. But with respect, Lord Leggett was making a much more nuanced point. And it was indeed the point that I specifically referred the court to earlier. He's, he's not saying you never need an irreducible minimum of obligation. All he says is that you can have a position where a taxi driver doesn't accept every assignment, but that doesn't mean that when he does accept an assignment, there isn't the requisite irreducible minimum of obligation, which is a point that I specifically referred the court to earlier. Hang on. They're not saying never uh, need an IMO, but can have a situation where it does not accept every booking, but still a worker contract if he accepts some bookings. Is that it? Indeed, my lord. It's the same point that we've discussed several times this you morning. No, have I got it right? <laughs> yes, yeah, so he says, let me read his words to you. No, no it's what you said. I, do not, I, said. I do not accept, however, that yeah. the fact that the claimant in that case, in the Mintley case, was free to work as and when he chose, mm. so this is the, the driver not taking some jobs but taking others, was a sufficient reason for holding that at times when he was working, so in relation to individual assignments, yeah. He was not employed under a contract to do work for the term, for that firm. This is a point I made earlier. The irreducible minimum of obligations under the umbrella contract is not determinative of the irreducible minimum of obligations under the individual assignment points. Well, I've written down, and you can tell me if I've written your submission down. You can have a situation where it does not accept every booking, but still a worker when working. So, my lord, this is the position of, uh, which I... Yeah, have I accurately understood what you submitted? I'm not, I'm not quite sure, my it's lord. It's a question of fact. I'll read it again. Uh, your Lord Leggett is not saying you never need uh, a reasonable minimum of obligation. He's saying that you can have a situation where a taxi driver does not accept every booking, but he's still a worker when he's working. Um, my lord, he says the claimant in that case was free to work as and when he chose, but that fact was not a sufficient reason for holding that at times when he was working, he was not employed under a contract to do work for the firm. Right, so I've written down correctly in what you are submitting. My Lord, I, I'm not sure you're being fair to me. No, what I'm saying to you at paragraph what 130, would you like me to write down then? What I'd like you to write down, my Lord, yes. is that in this passage, yes. paragraph 113, my learned friend suggested that this meant you never need an irreducible minimum yeah. of obligations. And I'm saying, that what, uh, what was being said here by Lord Leggett was a more nuanced point. Yeah, and what he was saying was what? And the nuanced point is he's saying that the question of whether there's an obligation to accept uh, particular assignments, so whether you're free to work as and when you choose, is not determinative of the position under individual assignment contracts, which is a point that I've made on a number of occasions this morning. So I say it's, that's a different point from the point that my learned friend sought to make. Similarly, I say that he misstated what was said in Addison Lee. So if I could ask you to turn to the Addison Lee judgment, which is at Pine Tab 21. Well, I'm not sure misstate is really a helpful or accurate word. I mean, he took us to the passages and made submissions about what we meant. He didn't, he didn't invent what the passages said, so maybe don't use the word mistake, please. Forgive me, my lady, but I'll show you the passages that the particular paragraph he took you to refer to, and, and then you can um, draw your own conclusions. Um, my lady, looking then at paragraph 13 of the Addison Lee Judgment, which is the paragraph that my learned friend particularly took you to, he said that this showed... Lord Justice Bean, again finding that irreducible minimum of obligations uh, isn't a prerequisite for worker status. Um, in this case, 
as recorded at paragraph 13, we have Mr. Jeans making a submission based on paragraph 128 of the Uber judgment. So if I can invite you to turn, hopefully keeping one page at page 360 authorities bundle, if I can invite you to turn to um, the Uber judgment, specifically paragraph 128. There we have a particular record of submission being made in relation to a contractual clause. Um, and then we have a Lord Leggett saying the position both as specified in the services agreement and in practice was that on the one hand a driver while logged onto the Uber app was free to decline or ignore any individual trip request and might well, for example, choose to do so if the request came from a passenger with a low rating. But on the other hand, the driver was required to be generally willing and available to take trips and a repeated failure by a driver to accept trip requests was treated as a breach of that requirement. Turning back to paragraph 13 of the Edison Lee judgment, as I understand it, Mr. Jeans was attempting to extrapolate from that um, a submission that in the Uber case, um, drivers had to be generally willing in that they had to be willing to accept uh, ass assignments heading in their direction because he contrasts what is the particular contractual position in the Edison Lee case with what is said to be the finding in Uber. And that's why Lord Justice Bean says, I don't think it is reasonably arguable that in the sentence just quoted, Lord Leggett was saying that there was an obligation on Uber drivers to do a minimum number of hours of work. Indeed, Mr. Jeans accepted an oral argument that, Ms. that Lord Leggett was referring only to times when each Uber driver was logged on. So, so what's being said in relation to ready and willing to work is in relation to specific individual assignments. So you have my position on what the Addison Lee judgment says and also on what was said in the Uber judgment uh, in relation to uh, the Mintley case. So I say, um, standing back from this case, we've got very clear findings of fact from the Employment Tribunal. Uh, this is a case in which it's been accepted all along and was accepted, as you've seen, in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. There's no obligation by Mr Somerville to provide work in those circumstances, uh, in light of the Uber judgment, but also the jurisprudence um, dating as far back as 2001, it's consistently found there's a need for an irreducible minimum of obligation in order for there to be limb worker status. The Uber judgment was merely a continuation of that jurisprudence. Uh, I say the employment tribunal in this case clearly erred in law. But you interpret a minimum uh, of obligation as meaning an obligation. You, you turn it round and say there must be an obligation to provide a minimum amount of work. Might be an hour, might be two hours. But there must be an obligation to provide some work. Indeed, my lord. Um, doesn't the, matter if you then do work, if you'll pay for work. It doesn't matter what happens thereafter. If way. there's no minimum somewhere in the contract, no obligation to provide a minimum amount of work. Whatever happens thereafter, that cannot be a contract. You, you cannot be a worker. Is that right? You can't be an individual working under a workers' contract. Indeed, my lord. Yeah. Um, but that's not just me, my lord. That's Lord Justice Underhill in the Byrne Brothers case. That is what's been consistently said by the EAT. That's what's said that's, in Pimlico. I, I appreciate that's Andrew your Byrne. submission. But yes. that, I just wanted to understand yes. the what I would describe as the far-reaching nature of your submission based on what you say is a proper analysis of the existing authorities. Uh, my lord, I, I understand my learned friend characterised it as radical, but when you have an opportunity, my lord, to see what the EAT has been saying um, for some 20 odd years on this topic, you will see that in fact this has been the uh, consensus. The, the for EAT some 20 in years. this case very carefully drew a distinction between or made clear what was being meant when uh, he referred to 
irreducible minimum and said it can be used in different ways and it's importance of clarity. My Lord, indeed, uh, so um, but clarity. other other <laughs> constituents, yeah. um, but other differently constituted employment appeal tribunals have interpreted mutuality of obligations to mean an irreducible minimum of obligation. Uh, and you yes, but the, so, anyway, okay, thank you. Yes. <coughs> Sorry, you're going to say you're no. poised. <laughs> Only to say that we will email up the preliminary hearing order, which we'll yep. Thank you very much. Just for completeness. Thank yep. you. Um, we'll obviously be, uh, thank you both very much for your submissions. We'll be uh, reserving our judgment. It will be provided in the usual way in due course in draft or typographical corrections. And we would hope that once you've received the draft, you'll be able to agree the order. But if not, we'll deal with any outstanding issues on paper with uh, short written submissions. So thank you very much. All right.